future danger is very important to teach, but we also need to teach acquaintance danger. You know, we see in the research that over 90% of the time, a child is abused by someone that they know, but it's not just someone that they know, it's also someone that they trust. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. This month, we're talking with Jenna Quinn, who's a child sexual abuse survivor, an author, and the driving force behind Jenna's Law. So, welcome, Jenna, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, firstly, congratulations on the unanimous passage of the Jenna Quinn Law through the Senate. Um, In a few words, can you tell us what does this law do and why is it needed? So, essentially, uh, the federal version of the Jenna Quinn Law is very similar to um, the state-by-state version. Um, Essentially, what this is is a primary prevention bill. Right. So so the goal is to um, prevent child sexual abuse or interfere somewhere in that grooming process before um, it it escalates to, you know, actual physical touching. Um, And so, you know, this education is equally important for um, teachers and caregivers, but not just the adults that are around um, the children and youth. It's also equally important that the children are able um, to be educated on what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, um, boundaries, and, and so forth. And so, you know, making sure that you have have um, both adults and students uh, at the same time aware and on the same page as far as, you know, being able to open that door of communication for kids to report and for adults to report um, is essentially what this is all about. So you have the prevention piece in the Jenna Quinn Law, and then you also have um, the recognizing piece. So an educator or a caregiver might not know what those warning signs are to look for in a child that uh, might have been sexually abused. And so knowing what those warning signs are, um, knowing how to report, um, you know, when to report and who to report to is is half of the battle, really, because there's a lot of fear and apprehension around reporting. Um, And so, you know, making sure that they are educated about this and how to prevent and report, and then also respond correctly if a child does make an outcry to them. So it's very comprehensive and trying to, you know, get all forms of um, primary prevention indicators and then also um, the reporting piece. So you mentioned that uh, the teachers, parents, and children are, are all uh, targeted with uh, with messages uh, through this uh, this program. Um, For the children, is it just about uh, recognizing when adults are behaving inappropriately with them, or is it also about making sure that children themselves don't inadvertently perhaps um, perpetrate abuse on, on their younger peers? Right. Uh, So actually, peer-to-peer abuse is um, on the rise, or at least our awareness of this is on the rise. And, you know, it makes up about 30% of child sexual abuse now uh, because kids are just exposed to so much more, um, especially now that we have smartphones and smart devices. And um, educating, you know, children and youth, right, uh, is so important. Uh, Really just teaching them self-respect right? Um, Self-respect and boundaries and and this is appropriate, this is not appropriate. Um, And the other reason why it's important is not just the peer-to-peer, but, you know, sometimes uh, you might have a youth that discloses to a friend and they tell that friend and that friend says, you know, well, don't tell anyone, let's have this be our secret. Well, you know, if they've gone through something, um, a Jenna's Law training, in one of their classes, that friend will know and say, well, hey, you know, it's okay for us to tell. I'll go with you if we want to go tell the teacher together. So it also can provide some of that peer support when it comes to reporting as well. Hmm. So what is the biggest misconception that most people have about how child sexual abuse happens? Oh, I, I'd say there are many. <laughs> there are many misconceptions about this. Uh, but really... Uh, you know, stranger danger is very important to teach, but we also need to teach acquaintance danger. You know, we see in the research that over 90% of the time, a child is abused by someone that they know, but it's not just someone that they know, it's also someone that they trust. And so teaching kids that someone that they love and someone that they know and someone that they trust 
could also be someone that hurts them, not just a stranger. Um, because this is where we see it's, it's really a relational crime. Um, oftentimes it's happening within the home um, or it's someone that's responsible for the child uh, in one way, shape or form, whether it be someone in school, on staff, um, an after school caregiver, you know, uh, soccer, band, you know, any extracurricular activities, you know, we see this in the news all the time. And so, um, you know, stranger danger only makes up about 10% of, of that. And so I'd say that's the big misconception. Mm. It must be the most kind of distressing and confusing uh, situation when it's someone that the child uh, knows and trusts. Um, I suppose that must be one reason why uh, children and adolescents often delay reporting abuse. Are there any other reasons why that delay uh, or, or even a, maybe some never report the abuse? Why is that? Yeah, so, you know, we see in uh, the different research that we have on self-disclosure is that about two-thirds of children um, don't tell right away um, if they ever do tell at all. You know, some adults have still chosen not to um, disclose that that's happened to them. And, um, you know, telling is, is a very scary thing uh, for many children because, well, for many reasons, oftentimes there are threats from the perpetrator. Um, they use fear and intimidation. Um, you know, if you tell, then who's going to take care of mommy? Who's going to pay the bills in the house? You know, if it's a, it's a, another caregiver within the home, that's a provider, right? Um, so there's many threats, um, and intimidation and fear, but sometimes there doesn't even need to be threats for a child just to be very afraid of telling, right? Because it's much easier to tell on a stranger, you know, stop that person. They stole my purse. Um, versus someone that you know and love and trust and there are strings attached, right? So I don't want to see this person hurting. Uh, my grandmother's going to be hurt by this person. You know, if this person gets in trouble, it's, it's going to be my fault. And so perpetrators also tell them that it's their fault. And so many times um, kids believe and youth believe that maybe I did something to bring this on. Uh, maybe this is a form of punishment for them. Maybe, maybe it is their fault. Um, and so you have, they feel it's their fault. They are um, somehow being threatened and intimidated. Um, but then also uh, there's that shame element. There's a factor of shame and, you know, they're very afraid, they're confused, they don't know what's going on. It's a very scary thing. Um, and so that's why with Jenna's Law, we help open that door of communication for them. And so for me as a survivor, this was never um, talked about in any of my safe places, right? So this, my parents never had a prevention conversation with me. My school never had a prevention conversation with me. Um, the church that I went to never had a prevention conversation with me. So this was never mentioned in any of my safe places. So I concluded as a kid, this must be something that's not okay to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so we can't expect kids to be the first individual to open that you know communication with an adult and so it helps facilitate that um, conversation and open that door of communication for them that if this has happened this is a safe place to tell I'm a safe adult to tell um, and it really really does help when it comes to um, you know how difficult that process can be for kids mm. so I wanted to ask you is the sexual abuse of children and adolescents always preventable Always is a very strong word. Um, I know that uh, the Child Molestation Research and Prevention Institute, um, they have claimed that 95% of child sexual abuse is preventable through education. Um, so whether it's 95% or 90% or 50% um, is really up to the conversations we're willing to have, um, the training, the quality of training we're really willing to have, um, the types of policies that we're willing to not just pass but enforce. And so it really takes, you know, many different uh, factors to ensure that everyone's on the same page, uh, adults and kids, policies, training, um, giving that conversation, you know, not just once but multiple times. Um, yeah, you can certainly reduce it, but uh, you're going to have situations, unfortunately, where, um, you know, sometimes 
children are grabbed, right? They're grabbed, they're grabbed from their homes, they're grabbed in parking lots uh, from their caregivers. And so, um, you know, you're just, you're going to have some of those situations, which is why the more we can talk about it, the more policies we have, the more education, um, the more likely we are to prevent this. Well, I guess the other side of uh, prevention is not just uh, relying on the child or their family, but also preventing perpetrators uh, from making that very terrible decision. And, and that's a whole different kettle of fish, I suppose. But, but um, I, m- my feeling is that these kind of prevention interventions are complementary, that we have to really build up uh, piece by piece uh, all of the interventions that we can to create a comprehensive uh, primary and secondary and tertiary prevention program um, that will, uh, if not completely em- eliminate abuse, then at least to reduce it substantially as much as we can. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. There's many, many layers, um, you know, in our society. And, you know, we need good policies, um, you know, for the whole uh piece of the pie, if you will, and, and all the different factors that perpetrator, offender education, um, you know, there's there's a lot of different um, aspects to this and how we can fight it. So uh, you mentioned very uh, sort of in passing um, that this law and your activism is uh, is has grown out of your own experience of abuse. I did notice when I was reading through your website that you refer to yourself, though, as a, a victor over the abuse that you experienced rather than as a victim of it. Why is that? Yeah, so I've, I've been referring to, um, you know, and I actually won't even say when I, when I travel and I speak to audiences and I do trainings and I speak to students and, um, you know, professionals. I always say the word survivor. Um, I never really use the word victim, and I've had uh, different journalists ask me the same question, you know, why do you never say victim? And, you know, part of that is because the word victim really is past tense. Um, You know, you wouldn't say I'm a victim of cancer. You would say I'm a survivor of cancer, and I'm in my second round of remediation because it hasn't killed me yet. Um, And so, you know, we have to really be careful and, and language is powerful, right? So we have to be careful in, in how we stigmatize um, survivors because the word victim to me is past tense. It's not, it's not present unless you're currently in a situation where you are um, you know, continuing to be victimized. Then in that very moment, you would be a victim, right? But once it has ended and it's not happening, then you're a survivor of it. And so I feel like that word is past tense and it really kind of puts you back into that, um, you know, moment of the crime, if you will. And, um, you know, you don't really see that type of language with other, um, with other things that people, you know, unfortunately go through in their different traumas. Thanks for that. Um, I, I wanted to shift the conversation back onto your law, the Jenna Quinn law itself. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you managed to have that introduced into Congress, which is such a great achievement? And, and was it much different than when you campaigned for the law at the state level? Uh, it was a little bit different, yes. So, um, so Jenna's Law was a Texas law um, originally and passed in 2009. And, you know, since then, many states have, um, you know, adopted different forms of it. And um, going... The the process was a little bit different because I did uh, make a trip to Washington, D.C., and I spoke at a conference called ALEC. It's the American Legislative Exchange Conference, and the people there were um, legislators. It's like a think tank conference for legislators, and so I went to go speak about that and, um, you know, contacted different senators' offices, um, Congress members to try to meet with them to talk about this issue. And so, um, you know, I was able to meet with John Cornyn's office, and um, they seemed, you know, very interested in this. Uh, Come to find out, Senator Cornyn has passed um, bipartisan legislation for um, human trafficking as well, um, and and other issues related to um, sexual abuse. And so, um, you know, they, of course, in person said this is a good idea we want to look into this we think this is something we can do and i had heard that 
I've heard that for years <laughs> since 2007. You know, you never really know. People say something to your face, but you don't really know if they're going to follow up through action, right? Everybody can agree that this is important work, right? <laughs> so, um, so I wasn't sure how serious they were or any of the other offices that I met with. Um, but then, you know, the shutdown happened and, and everything, and so um, I wasn't quite sure what was, you know, going to happen. And um, they did. They decided that they, you know, wanted to move forward with this and began working with them on sending them research and talking points and language. Um, and you know, it just it just takes that patience and a little bit of grit to, <laughs> you know, sometimes face opposition and people that don't necessarily think that it's as important um, as you think it is. But um, yeah, the process was a little bit different. Um, seeing it as though you know it's it's congressional and it's not state by state um, but overall um, you know the facts are what they are and you know they're really undeniable for um, people that want to say that it's not a social problem when it is indeed um, and one thing i love about the law is that uh, despite all that's gone into it it's actually really short really simple um, and in fact it's not very prescriptive about the exact form or content of the education and training that it mandates. So I was wondering, in the states at least, that have implemented a law based on Jenner's law already, have you been satisfied with how it's been done? And have you found any areas where you think it could be improved in, in terms of the way that it's been implemented? Yeah, I think, um, you know, most states are um, locally controlled as far as their school districts are concerned. And so, you know, most school districts don't want the state coming and telling them what to do, you know, mandating what they have to do and when they have to do it and, and so forth. And so the mandate is there that they do have to do it, but leaving it up to them on, on implementation was a key factor in um, making sure that this, is, this was able to pass, right? Because um, thank goodness now there are several different programs out there for um, training teachers and caregivers and there's great programs out there for training students and youth um, on sexual abuse prevention. And so, um, you know, every school district is different. The demographics are different. And so a program that might work for one district, you know, might not work as well for a different program because they offer it um, in a bilingual format, right? So um, it was really important to let the districts decide, you know, Yes, they have to do it, but the way they want to do it and what time of year they want to do it, um, giving them that flexibility has has worked very well. Um, I will say, though, I would love to see, um, you know, more accountability for this if the law isn't being done. Um, you know, what are the consequences? Does the school lose a letter grade? Are they not a blue ribbon school anymore? Um, I would love to see more consequences enforced for um, if they fail um, to follow through with the with the genocide mandate. Hmm. Well, uh, with the rare exception of laws such as yours, many laws that claim to be for the protection of children aren't really evidence-informed and seem to be based on a misunderstanding about how abuse actually happens. How can we guard against the misuse of think-of-the-children rhetoric to advance agendas that don't actually protect children? You know, I, I truly believe that um, education is um, the way uh, to really, really rebuttal and, and show, you know, what works versus what doesn't work. Um, and, you know, I think that educating people, um, you know, sometimes people don't do their research, which is not very good. <laughs> um, but trying to educate people and show, um, show the data to say, hey, you know, this is working and this isn't. Let's find another way to do this if this is if this is going to be your platform. Um, so that's I'm a, I'm a numbers person. I'm a research person. I'm a data person, and um, you know, those those can work for you or against you depending on you know what you're what you're striving to do to help kids. So what's the next step for Jenna Quinn after your namesake law is enforced throughout the United States? I, you know, this is such an important field and uh, and growing and its awareness. And so, you know, for me, this is really um, just the beginning of more awareness and, uh, you know, more programs. I enjoy 
um, curriculum writing, and I enjoy um, helping write programs um, to actually do the implementation for these trainings. Um, and so I hope to, uh, you know, write programs and just find more ways to um, get education out there uh, for people that, you know, might have zero education on what they can do and, and how they can talk to their kids about this. How closely have you been involved in writing the curricula for states that have adopted, adopted Janus Law? Um, I've, I've helped write a, a few different uh, curriculums, um, whether they've used it for Jenna's Law or whether they haven't um, is, you know, really up to the districts. But, um, you know, helping find someone that's been on the other side yeah. um, as a survivor um, to help write them is um, really important as far as messaging. Absolutely. Well, it's really exciting to see uh, how, how well uh, this is doing and how it's been taking off. And uh, I really hope it... Uh, advances to the next stage. As you know, uh, we're trying to help um, engage our community to try and uh, push this law across the line. So by the time our viewers and listeners uh, see this podcast, if it hasn't passed the House of Representatives, we'd love you to phone up your representative to ask them to support this really important law. Um, So uh, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to close by asking you, Is there anything else that you think our viewers or listeners should know about preventing and reporting child sexual abuse? Um, I think, you know, going back to, um, you know, misconceptions about this and, um, you know, I would say not telling is the most difficult part of this this entire crime is, um, you know, the how difficult it is for um, survivors to disclose this. And, um, you know, I just, I just want everyone to know, regardless of where their education is, that, um, you know, false reporting is extremely rare. Um, and I get those questions a lot in my trainings and in my talks. And, you know, we're only 4 to 8% of reports are actually, actually fabricated. Um, and so it's such a very small very small um, amount of reports. And so I would always say, no matter you know where you are or what kids you're around, always believe the child, always believe them, and always assure them that they did the right thing in telling and that it's not their fault. That's such an important message. Well, well thank you very much for talking with us and uh, congratulations once again on the success of your campaign so far. I really uh, wish you all the best for, for the next stage. So uh, thanks once again, Jenna. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. This has been the final episode of Season 2 of Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention, so you've got 23 other episodes to catch up on while we take our season break. You can also donate to support our work. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye for now.